The rubric continuum concept is one of the main models of riverine ecosystem ecology. First proposed by Vinot and others in 1980, it provided a framework that describes how streams systematically change as they get bigger and how energy flow and the invertebrate community structure changes as well. The river continuum concept is based on the idea that a stream size increases, the influence of the surrounding forest or riparian area decreases. In order to explain this better, I'm going to first discuss stream order, a basic concept in fluvial geomorphology that was used to assign different sections of a river in the river continuum concept. When you think about stream order, the number correlates directly to that size of the stream. So the lower the number, the smaller the stream. When two first order streams come together, they form a second order stream. When two second order streams come together, they form a third order stream. Streams of a lower order joining a higher order stream do not change the order of higher streams. While it's possible to have a second order stream flow into a fourth order stream, the most important thing to remember is that the fourth order stream is formed by two third orders coming together somewhere and so on. Before we walk through the next sections on the different classifications of rivers in the river continuum concept and other pertinent terminology, I want to provide an example watershed that is close to my heart, the Yellow River watershed. Around 10 years ago, when I was a river restoration intern for the Nature Conservancy, I participated in a watershed-wide assessment using U.S. Fish and Wildlife's Riverine Threats Assessment Protocol and Roskin's methodology. Over the course of nine months, I canoed, boated, or weighed its hundreds of miles of streams from its headwaters in Op, Alabama, to the mouth of the Yellow River's main channel where it empties into the Pensacola Bay. This experience is something that has always stayed with me and one of the main reasons I decided to change careers from archaeology to water management years ago. The Yellow River is a sandy, softwater, i.e. blackwater river, which flows through Alabama and Florida and has an average annual flow of 1,181 CFS. Along with its major tributary, the Shoal River, the Yellow River primarily flows through forested and agricultural lands. The Yellow River watershed is also noted for relatively high fish and mollusk biodiversity. Now that I've introduced you to the Yellow River, I'll cover some more terminology that will be discussed further in the next slides. Remember that the river continuum concept describes longitudinal ecological patterns or changes along a river. Streams can change in physical structure, disturbance regimen, where the energy or carbon comes from, such as sea palm, which is coarse particulate organic matter, and F palm, which is fine particulate organic matter. And then the types of organisms that live in them also change. Overall, the benthic and vertebrate communities can shift to track the dominant sources of energy. So, across stream watersheds, different processes will control the aquatic community dynamics. For example, we found that the impaired conditions on the Yellow River watershed were strongly influenced by the geology and underlying bed material, such as sand and clay, which characterizes the bank and bed materials of rivers and streams. These smaller sized substrates are at greater risk than the larger sized materials, as indicated by Roskin. All living organisms depend on the supply of energy for their activities. In most terrestrial systems, this is contributed in situ by photosynthesis of green plants. This is autochthonous production. In aquatic communities, the autochthonous input is provided by photosynthesis of large plants and attached algae in shallow waters, aka the littoral zone, and by mi microscopic phytoplankton. In contrast, the allochthonous production is energy produced from outside of an ecosystem, such as leaf litter falling to the river. At the beginning of the river, it is very strongly influenced by material falling from outside the system, especially organic material, which is consumed by various microinvertebrates, which we will discuss further on the next slides. So let's explore the Yellow River a little more together. The first classification in the river continuum concept is headwaters, which is stream orders one through three. As you see here, the headwaters are narrow and shaded. Any small stream running through a wooded catchment derives most of its energy input from leaf litter shed by surrounding vegetation. Shading from the trees keeps the stream temperatures cooler and prevents any significant growth of attached algae or aquatic higher plants. As the stream widens further downstream, shading by trees is restricted to the margins and autochthonous production increases. The extent of this production varies depending on the amount of sunlight present. Bed sediment size also decreases as compared to the headwaters. 
people downstream by canoe to deeper and usually more turbid waters, the riparian vegetation contributes less and the role of the microscopic phytoplankton becomes more important. The river is exposed to more sunlight and is usually warmer than higher up in the stream system. The stream bed sediments are generally very fine grained. Throughout the length of the river, the proportion of the four major macroinvertebrates, such as strutters, collectors, grazers, and predators, change. Recall, what benthic macroinvertebrates eat determines how they are ordered along the longitudinal profile or functional group. Strutters occur in low order streams, grazers in the middle order, and collectors in the high order streams. With the exception of the predators, all these organisms feed directly from plant material. So what does all this mean and why are macroinvertebrates so important anyway? In the river continuum concept, the note et al. argue that a river's biological and chemical processes correspond to physical properties. They are basically explicitly linked. And if they are linked, then they are predictable and abstractable. Aquatic macroinvertebrates play a key role in nutrient cycling in aquatic ecosystems because they are the primary processors of organic materials. Some studies suggest that aquatic macroinvertebrates are responsible for processing up to 73% of riparian leaf litter that enters the stream. Aquatic macroinvertebrates are also ecologically significant because they have the ability to integrate changes in both the aquatic and associated terrestrial environment. This sensitivity to environmental change helps detect physical, chemical, and biological changes in the ecosystems where they live. There have been some questions and challenges with the river continuum concept. For example, the river continuum concept was developed in Pennsylvania. Can we apply it elsewhere? What about tropical environments, for example? Additionally, what happens if we have natural discontinuities such as beaver dams or anthropomorphic disturbances and impoundments such as dams? Dams are artificial designs which interrupt natural discharge, causing many changes to river characteristics and function. Does the process start over when a river is dammed? In the Yellow River watershed, we estimated close to 3,000 impoundments as seen on the red dots in the map, and the National Inventory of Dams has cataloged more than 79,000 dams in the U.S. So the patterns understood in the RCC might not be as straightforward when facing these issues. Good news is, research on the river continuum concept and other river ecosystem concepts or models have continued to grow and expand. Some studies have been done that indicate the RCC generally applies to running waters on tropical islands. There's likely still a lot of opportunities to study and apply the RCC elsewhere as well. Additionally, there has been an attempt to further expand the concept of the RCC. The flood pulse concept, or FPC, adds a lateral dimension to the river continuum concept. The FPC discusses the importance of lateral pulses of energy and matter to a floodplain and associated oxbows, back swamps, etc. during flooding. The riverine productivity model emphasizes the productivity of local river edge communities, and the riverine ecosystem synthesis combines RCC, FPC, and the river productivity model and refers to progressions of habitat patches formed by local geomorphology and climate. 